Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm uh, Richard Kitney. I'm uh, from Imperial College in London. I'm the uh, co-director with Paul Fremont, who's sitting here in the front row of our uh, synthetic biology hub, as we call it, uh, which currently has about 130 <coughs> people in it. So it's quite a big operation nowadays, which Paul and I have built up. Um, this afternoon's session is uh, uh, primarily about medical applications, and I've been asked to uh, say a few words by way of introduction. So what I thought I would do is to just uh, slightly broaden out the topic uh, to sort of bracket, in a way, what people are going to say and talk a little bit about synthetic biology and uh, biotech. And so I thought I'd start off with a couple of quotations from this afternoon's speakers here. Uh, where The key thing here is that um, uh, basically uh, since the uh, 15th century, uh, well, this is what uh, uh, Martin Fussnagger is saying, is that uh, the basic treatment strategies have remained pretty much unchanged, more or less until today, uh, when we're now starting to consider the inter interdependence of these pathophysiologies in terms of major diseases of the 21st century, like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And I'll come back to cardiovascular disease in a few minutes. Um, also, uh, a comment from uh, one of our other speakers this afternoon, um, one of the major aims of synthetic biology is to design microorganisms with novel <coughs> capabilities that can be applied for the development of new vaccines, diagnostic sensors, therapeutic interventions for major diseases such as cancer. And again, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but the other speakers, or the speakers rather, uh, will be talking about this in more detail. So I want to start off by, by way of introduction here by talking about uh, shaping the evolution of healthcare. And this is something that um, uh, I've worked on for many years, actually, before we really even got involved in synthetic biology. And there are a number of changes which have occurred in terms of, uh, of uh, healthcare over the last 20 or 30 years. We've moved from an environment of data poor to an environment where we have data rich. Uh, we've moved from patient homogeneity, where uh, clinicians typically considered patients to be homogeneous groups, to individual risk and assessment, risk assessment and treatment selection. Uh, we've moved from intervention against clinically evident disease to disease protection and prevention. And finally, uh, in many uh, advanced uh, countries, we've moved effectively for a fragmented delivery system of healthcare to integrated networks and continuity of care. So these are some of the significant changes which have occurred in healthcare. For me, one of the uh, most important dates in terms, I mean, obviously it's a continuum, but one of the most important dates uh, was uh, 2001 with the initial publication of the initial sequencing of the human genome, obviously in Nature, which everybody uh, in the room uh, will be familiar with this paper. But from a healthcare point of view, uh, many observers see this as being effectively the dawn of uh, molecular-based medicine. And that, I think, is a, in a way a key benchmark. We work in synthetic biology, but from a medical point of view, you can also think of this state as being potentially the dawn of molecular-based medicine. So in terms of uh, this new medicine, um, nowadays, um, many people work in general applications of uh, biology and physiology to, um, uh, to healthcare, now begin to think of uh, not simply uh, healthcare at different at individual levels, in what I call, as you'll see in a moment, this was, we published this in 2008, the biological continuum, but looking across the different levels of the biological continuum. And incidentally, uh, this is uh, obviously an image of the double helix. So um, a couple of, I'll get on to talking about the molecular basis of this in a moment, but I wanted to just talk uh, in a couple of slides, just about the other big developments that occurred in medicine, which is visualization and imaging, and the, the fact that uh, there are all these different methods of uh, imaging, including the example I'm going to show you, which is cryo EM. And with cryo EM now, uh, and this is a slide uh, actually from about five or six years ago, 
uh, you can take conventional, a conventional air micrograph. <coughs> Uh, you can then uh, reconstruct in three dimensions, so this is a surf surface render volume, and that allows you actually, when you do a pseudo colour, uh, to pull out um, things like the actin filaments, so the ones in red. Uh, comp complexes, they're the ones uh, shown in green here, as it says here, prim prim mostly ribosomes and the membranes in blue. So you can get these exquisite images. Uh, even at this level, but also uh, now at uh, uh, even more refined levels of the biological con continuum. Um, but the other key development, which is, um, I think, uh, primarily what we're focusing on uh, this afternoon, is uh, essentially omics data. And it's the idea that um, different types of omics data uh, have resulted in... Uh, uh, high throughput science with microwaves, gel electrofluoresis. A lot of data comes into the lab every day, flow cytometry, etc. And so uh, when I think about uh, uh, all this data and indeed information coming, into, coming in, uh, uh, traditionally one thinks about the upper levels of the what I call the biological continuum, so systems, viscera and tissues, but in terms of next steps, uh, which is what we're all potentially working on, we have to think about the lower levels of the biological continuum, down at the cell, protein, and gene level, but also how this, from a healthcare point of view, how this rate relates to uh, what we called here in this paper in 2008, the, uh, the care continuum. So not only primary, secondary, and tertiary care, but also telecare and home care. And so now, from a healthcare point of view, uh, we're beginning to see, and I, I, I for a few years was on the board of one of the main hospitals in London, uh, and I observed the development of healthcare much more into these areas in terms of integration. So if we now think about um, synthetic biology, uh, when we think about synthetic biology at Imperial, uh, we think about systematic design. And Paul may have touched on this the other day, uh, but we see this very much as the basis of engineering biology. So from our point of view, synthetic biology is very much about the engineering of biology. And systematic design, you can break down into uh, these major, if you like, principles, components, modularization, standardization, and characterization linked to being able to uh, <coughs> control the complexity of the biology according to human design, that's the aim of the systematic design, but also a big uh, trend, if you like, within the UK, but also in other parts of the European uh, community is uh, the whole issue about responsible research innovation. Another key area in terms of our strategy is the application of the design cycle, starting off with the specifications, <laughs> going through design, <coughs> modeling, building, testing and validation, and then learning and debugging. So this is a variant on the design, build, test paradigm that um, is uh, widely used within synthetic biology. So in many ways, the vision is that uh, many uh, drugs which are currently available are based upon known theoretic properties, uh, uh, therapeutic properties of various types of plants. Uh, and Jim Hasloff, uh, I'm probably be talking about some of this tomorrow. Um, but uh, we believe within synthetic biology that it will be we can use synthetic biology to engineer uh, synthetic versions, and also synthetic biology devices for the detection of various types of infections. So these are two examples of the vision within synthetic biology. Okay, so many drugs are currently available, and they're based on known therapeutic pro uh, ther therapeutic properties. But there is a problem. Uh, and that is uh, since 1975, uh, where the average spend uh, of uh, uh, R&D profits within, say, GSK, or one of those large drug companies, was about 5%. Uh, today, it is uh, at least 22%. So the cost is going up. And today, the average time for a drug to get to market is 11 years. And when you think of that in an industrial context, where you've only got well, a maximum of about 20 years, uh, that doesn't, in terms of patents, that doesn't leave a lot of time. So the perceived solution to this 
is, uh, well, a few years ago, Sieve solution was mergers, bigger is better, combinatorial chemistry, uh, computational chemistry, all of these were areas that uh, Big Pharma worked on. But now there is uh, uh, the development of focus, uh, I would say, uh, much more on genomics and also developing focus on synthetic biology techniques. Um, and this is all about the realization of personalized drugs uh, uh, to develop th the therapeutic properties of these drugs so that they have low or no side effects. And the, the vision here is that synthetic biology will aim to allow the optimization of, of existing production processes and the design of new processes. And we're uh, very, um, very involved in that through our industrial translation center. So here are some examples of medical applications. Uh, a number of these uh, will be uh, uh, discussed this afternoon. Okay, the long-term vision, uh, not the long-term vision, but a long-term vision, uh, is, uh, uh, for example, the use of biosensors which permanently reside within the body to detect particular types of abnormality, for example, arterial disease and cancer. Um, and uh, for another example is the extension of the concept of highly adaptive vaccines and antibiotics uh, so that, as I say here, uh, the vaccine, for example, can rapidly adapt to kill a particular type of influenza. And we, we're actually seeing that coming through uh, now, even industrially. So um, one example of this is arterial disease. Uh, when I talk about this, and we've got a nice row down the middle here, I usually say about 50% of the room are going to die from this. So, you know, it's a pretty important thing. You have to work out which side you're on. Uh, but, you know, here's the arterial plaque. Typically, nowadays, what we do is to diagnose the arterial plaque, or at least one method of diagnosing the arterial plaque, which is uh, used quite a lot, is to use uh, arterial catheters, catheters with ultrasound on them so you can image the plaque. But uh, the, the developing ideas here are, can we use synthetic biology biosensors uh, and the possible in situ, well, I've said manufacture of plaque-busting drugs, but as you'll see in a moment, uh, there could be an alternative strategy here. And the alternative strategy is to use nano cages where we uh, build in a biosensor which has a detector and amplifier and then feeding through to a controller which controls the nano cage. So the nano cage is a hollow cage which you, protein nano cage, which you can actually control in terms of opening and closing and put in there, for example, a, a plaque busting drug. So that, that's part of the basic strategy. If you extend that, I've almost finished, if you extend that, uh, this brings in the need for biologic, which I'll explain in a moment. And uh, one of the things that we've done over a number of years is develop a series of different types of, of logic gates. So here's one example of one of our AND gates. Uh, so I'm sure everybody in the room knows that the basis of any computer is a logic gates. And here we have biological logic gates. That's been extended more recently in terms of our work into the development of what's called a half adder. And we're now moving quite well towards uh, more sophisticated biologically based computing based on biological uh, logic gates. And so this will lead to uh, various uh, applications. So things like counters, calculators, and microprocessors um, in the longer term, but in the near term, more sophisticated uh, uh, biosensors and the possibility for intracellular control and signaling. So here's an example of uh, work that uh, we've been working on, which is uh, uh, developing these uh, biosensors to be able to uh, detect uh, carcinoma within, within the liver and, and uh, using the biosensors to detect, uh, carcin uh, to detect cancerous cells as shown here. Um, it turns out that um, uh, in order to detect the cells, uh, it's not uh, optimal to simply have one channel in the biosensor. So this is where the logic comes in, the potential, and this is potential, not reality, to be able to uh, have a series of inputs which then go through biological circuitry or biological circuitry to control the release of, in the case of cancer, a, a psychotoxic drug. And so uh, I think within the medical context, uh, what we are seeing is, a, is a, a fairly rapid development, I would argue, um, from conventional medicine through to 
molecular base medicine. So that's uh, uh, a quick introduction uh, to try and give you at least some, some of the views that I hold in terms of medical applications. So I think um, we now need to move on to the um, first speaker in this afternoon's presentations, um, which is Nico 